Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. Um, very much a companion piece to, to Toby's piece, but I, I, I want to look at it in a sense, I suppose, more from a kind of policymaker's perspective. Uh, I, from less of an academic perspective, not from an uncritical policymaker's perspective, but the way that these ideas and these discourses have been translated into policymakers' languages and the way that they've affected what policymakers have done over the last sort of 20 years in this area. Um, now, I'm going to be tracing that development primarily, uh, the development of those terms and the use of those terms primarily in the context that I know best, which is, is, is the UK. Uh, and on one hand, I sort of apologise for that. On the other hand, it's the context I know best. And I'm hoping that, as in Zhao's paper yesterday, talking about the specifics of a particular place and the specifics of particular incidents will have wider resonance for other people in, in, in very different kind of contexts. Um, I'm going to end up having talked about the way that these terms are used and, and the way that they're conceptualised and, and something about how they're acted on, um, talking about the kind of problems and issues of all of them, uh, including, and this is probably a novelty for this session, I think, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about arts funding and arts policy. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, okay, so at the end we're going to, we're going to actually return to the subject of the arts at some point. Um, now there's a real danger that Toby and I are in sort of violent agreement on most of these things. So if you're looking for some sort of, you know, uh, outside a radically different kind of perspective that we could all end up having a fight about, um, you might want to go somewhere else, really. But I am going to try and look at it from slightly more of a kind of worm's eye point of view, really. So it's more of a different um, way of looking at the same issues rather than I have a particular different kind of um, ideological uh, 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 distinction. But, I, but, I, but some, of those, some of the issues, I think, may be nuanced differently in the way that I talk about them. And also, as you'll certainly... For people, I've had a conversation with several people since I've been here about the importance of translating between policy languages and academic languages, and you're probably students of discourse might be interested to, to compare and contrast the way Toby and I actually sort of talk about these things in a sense. Okay, um, cultural industries. The, the t when I say these issues, actually, I didn't even tell you what the title is. The title is Cultural Industries, Creative Industries, Creativity, Innovation, right? And that's the, that's the kind of circuit, that's the kind of trajectory that I actually want to trace in this. Um, so I'm going to start off with kind of cultural industries. And it's, it was interesting in the, in the Q&A at the end that we ended up with kind of Adorno, because I started off my slides with Adorno. He's obviously having a great rebirth. And in fact, even the um, UK Arts Council, which is, the, which is the primary arts funding agency in the UK, um, which funds a series of kind of um, literature reviews, basically, publishing series of literature reviews, many of which are very good. I, I commend them to you. Um, funded one that my friend Justin O'Connor wrote last year, uh, which is actually a really interesting piece on the effect of Adorno on the debate about cultural industries and creative industries. I commend it to you all, but if you want to get hold of a copy, don't get hold of the published copy that the Arts Council did, which is utterly eviscerated, where there's about two paragraphs about Adorno. Get Justin's email from me, email him and ask him to send you the original text. And it's actually quite, and if he'll do that, it's actually quite an interesting comparison about what happens when you publish often in a policy context, what happens to the text and, and, and how it's sort of later, later produced. But it's, it's a very good piece. Anyway, I wanted to talk really about the way that the term cultural industries was originally adopted, um, primarily, as Toby pointed out, by the Greater London Council in, in the UK in the early 1980s. Because until that term, even in Europe, the notion, the notion of the cultural industry was largely a kind of negative thing. It was a critique. It was seen in that way. It was seen to have those kind of connotations. And when... European cities rebuilt themselves after the Second World War uh, through partly a process of kind of cultural regeneration, the, the, the same cultural regeneration and, and massive rebuilding that gave Gary Becker all his unfortunate ideas about human capital. Um, when they were doing that, they didn't talk about it much as cultural industries. They tended to talk about it then as the arts and the focus of, of the first few decades in Europe after the Second World War was on rebuilding through the arts. So it was about rebuilding the traditional high cultural infrastructure, art, art galleries, opera houses, etc. So the term was adopted, the first, uses, the first uses of the term of the cultural industries as a kind of economic development strategy are really in the late 70s, early 80s, where um, people who are working at the Greater London Council, including Toby's mate Justin and, and others, um, wanted to use this term in, in a sense in a more kind of positive, in a more sort of positive way. Um, and I'll go on to that in a, little, in a little bit. But one of the elements of the critique which the term continued, one of the elements of critique which remained in the term cultural industries, 
was that it did for European policymakers have a connotation about the importance of withstanding the commercial might of US culture. So the cultural industries for Wells were very much about how can we develop and um, sustain an indigenous European or state level or, or local level cultural base to withstand the kind of uh, hegemony of, of European, um, of, 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 sorry, of US kind of commercial culture. So that, that remained part of it. But other than that, the term underwent as part of cultural industry strategies, something of a change. And there, and there, was, there was sort of several reasons that it acquired, as I say, more positive connotations. Um, it was based in part on the realisation amongst these people and other uh, academics and thinkers at the time, influenced by Hoggart and Raymond Williams and influenced by the people of Birmingham, that the vast majority of, of culture that was consumed, even, even in, in Europe, was produced outside of the state funding system for the arts which doesn't really seem like news to anyone here. But actually, there was a time when that was regarded as, as, as sort of news. It was news to people that um, most people's cultural uh, lives and cultural exposure was not to do with kind of arts policy and, and what the state supported as the arts, but with various forms of kind of commercial culture. So the decision was taken, um, in a sense, to set up a cultural industry strategy, the aim of which was to, in, in the, in the, I'm quoting here, to intervene through, not against the market. So a decision was taken that you couldn't necessarily um, simply affect these things through traditional arts policy and traditional arts funding, but nor could you ignore the reality of commercial culture which made up the cultural life of most of your kind of citizens. What you needed was state intervention into the market production of popular culture, in a sense. This is also part of the collapse of the high-low cultural kind of distinctions. So instead of the state simply funding opera, or the high arts, the performing arts, unpopular culture, as we might call it. The state sought to fund things like, and, and did in London very briefly, uh, magazine production, popular music, film. I mean, the state in Britain had always funded TV programs, but genuinely popular forms of culture the state sought to intervene in. There were even um, um, uh, publicly funded record labels, publicly funded recording studios for popular music, these kind of things. So there was a, there was a notion that, A, you had to work with the grain of the market, but it was a fairly standard social democratic uh, approach that you could regulate the market, you could intervene in the market where it was undersupplying culture. And more than that, you could support these sort of popular democratic forms of culture, which would in turn give voice to marginalized communities. And this has always been very much a central kind of concern and theme of cultural industries policies, that in some ways, by supporting the production of popular cultural forms, you were supporting the groups of people who were responsible for producing those popular cultural forms. So working class people, people of color, women. These were the groups that were seen to be less included in a traditional dead white European male high art world. So popular culture would also, in a sense, be a job creation scheme and a voice, very importantly both, uh, for sort of marginal communities. Okay, so what happened to this brave experiment, which, which lasted all of sort of five minutes, effectively, um, <laughs> although, it's, although its echoes are with us still. Uh, the Greater London Council, which had been, which was the top tier of government in, in, in London, and was in, called the Greater London Council from about 65 to, I think, 86, uh, was disbanded by Margaret Thatcher in, in 1986. It had been an incredible thorn in the side of, of the Thatcherite government during the... Um, during the 80s, notably because its offices were right opposite the House of Parliament on the Thames. They were almost absolutely directly opposite the House of Parliament. And for most of the 80s, when unemployment was rising uh, dramatically fast, the uh, GLC building had a counter on it, which used to count up every day the number of people who were losing their jobs uh, in, in, in Thatcher's kind of uh, uh, destruction of, of the British welfare state and its manufacturing capacity. So this was a kind of physical sign on the GLC building of what Thatcherism was doing. Understandably enough, uh, Thatcher wasn't hugely keen on this, uh, nor was she particularly keen on local democracy. So the GLC was actually disbanded in 86 and power was devolved to, lo to lower tiers of government. So London has 32 boroughs uh, which were, which, to which power was devolved. There was no central government in London until it was reinstated in, 19, in 2000 by the new Labour government when the same figure, Ken Livingstone, a very interesting politician who had run the GLC and had run this cultural industries um, experiment, came back as London's first elective mayor. So Livingstone kind of appears in, in and out of this story in a slightly sort of ghostly way. 
Okay, so fast forward from 1986 to 1997. Uh, the cult term cultural industries has survived. It survived very much in the academic literature. In fact, that's where it goes. It leaves the public policy discourse. People in public policy don't talk about cultural industries for, for quite a long time. And it goes into academia and it goes into academic work. And it's sort of very unfortunately, despite the work of people like Angela and Dick and some of the other people that we've heard from, some of the other people we've been talking about, it sort of disappears into the academy in some ways. It becomes part of uh, cultural studies discourse. It becomes part of some, but not enough, empirical work on the cultural industries. But it disappears from policymakers' vocabularies uh, pretty much. Um, so 1997, new Labour government um, is elected in Britain after a long period of, of kind of Thatcherism. They're very keen to, du to dump what they regard as kind of old Labour baggage, i.e. British uh, Labour Party kind of socialist, social democratic baggage. And one of the ways that they do this um, is through reuse of certain terms and rebranding. The famous incident at the time of um, a publication by a guy who's a friend of mine, actually, but you know, I will forgive him this, of a, pol of a pamphlet called Rebranding Britain, um, <laughs> which led to a whole series of other kind of publications about rebranding Middlesbrough, rebranding Irvine, rebranding everywhere else. But anyway, there was a, 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 a huge effort on the part of the new Labour government to, re to, to invent, to coin new terms for uh, often for old policy problems, and sometimes with the same approach to kind of policy problems. Now, a key, a key figure in this... Um, new Labour approach to what became the creative industries is actually David Putnam, uh, now I think Lord Putnam, um, ex film director and a one time head of Columbia Studios, again for like five minutes, I think, 18 months, two years, I think he read Columbia Studios. And having been a film director himself and had worked in the British film industry and in the British advertising industry, he was very struck during his time at Columbia by the way the US state, and Toby's talked a lot about this, the way the US state uh, supported the kind of commercial muscle of Hollywood. And rather than um, taking a sort of critical perspective on this and kind of writing a book about it or something, he sort of thought, why don't we do this? If the US is so successful at selling its IP, selling its, selling its, its film industry, it employs so many people through this, it gets its, 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 its voice in the, to the world in this way, why can't we do this? We're, we're a country, relatively rich country, we make movies too, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So his response to, to that process was actually uh, to, when he returned to Britain, was to be, he was the advisor for the incoming cultural minister, uh, a guy called Chris Smith. And he advised him to set up a task force to look at what were to become known as the creative industries. So a, creative, a task force was set up largely of um, corporate interests, it has to be said, to uh, come up with this notion, to, to kind of, to, both to map and to understand the, the size and shape and dynamic, dynamics of, of the creative industries, um, and also to put them on the public policy agenda. I've been doing some interviews recently with the people who were members of this task force for a sort of historical piece I'm doing. And um, there's a lot of talk about, as often is when you're talking to kind of policymakers, about we got Blur to mention this at this speech, and this was a classic moment for us. This is absolutely opaque to citizens and to the rest of us. But when you talk to kind of policymakers about how these things work, it's often... We were so pleased, we worked so hard, we got Tony Blair to say the word creative industries at this particular speech on this night, and then we knew we had it, kind of thing. So it's a very kind of interesting process of kind of argumentation. Um, so why was it called the creative industries? Huge volumes of, of words have been devoted to this issue. Um, and when you interview these people, what's really interesting about it is they don't see it as a hugely ideological shift. They don't say to you, we wanted to dump any notion of Adorno. They've never heard of Adorno. I mean, David Putnam probably has, but a lot of them haven't. Um, they don't say we wanted to dump old Labour baggage. What they say to you is there was a concern that the term cultural industries task force was too connected to the arts. It only spoke to the notion of the arts. That the term culture, the Europeans in the room will love this, is too European. Europeans have culture, but you know, Anglo-Saxons don't really have culture. It's too, too, too European, and it's too problematic. That's what they'll say. It was too problematic. There was this notion of the kind of culture wars much, being much fought out much more kind of uh, uh, dynamically over here, but nonetheless, that, that was behind it. Culture has too many problems. It's too European. And very fundamentally, it's too much about the arts. So we needed a new term that would capture some of the things about culture, but would move it beyond the arts into things like design, 
into architecture and into, crucially, in this case, advertising. And the reason it was moved beyond those kind of things is because these are service sector industries in which the UK actually has some competitive advantage. That's why those things are included. The UK has no film industry to speak of. It has a strong domestic TV industry. It does pretty well in music, but fundamentally the creative industry sectors, it does well in other service sector industries of design, advertising, and, and architecture. And therefore, they were included in this, in this um, grouping of, of creative industries. Um, so there was a sense in which it was trying to broaden it out. Um, the includes, so the inclusion of the arts and, and, and the performing arts and the traditional kind of cultural sectors and these kind of service industry models. And certainly people who were involved at the time would also say that they had maintained the attempt to collapse high-low cultural distinctions. And I think I mean, video games, for example, was included at the time in leisure software, which in 1998 was not a no-brainer that it would be now. So there was an attempt also to reach out to new and emerging kind of popular cultural forms. Okay, so it represented, in retrospect, a big change. This is one of the interesting things about kind of policy and history, in, in, in a sense. And in retrospect, the move from cultural industries to creative industries represented a big change. And there was clearly ideological baggage associated with it, and there was an ideological shift underway, in the sense that the new Labour government was not a socialist as the old Labour government. It was much more bought into a neoliberal project. It wanted to... Um, encourage its citizens to adapt to the constant changes of neoliberalism. It lost any critique of capitalism, that capitalism could ever be replaced. All you could do was learn to adapt to it better. So there's a huge ideological shift uh, uh, that, that's masked by that. But in terms of the actual terminology of saying we're going to call it the creative industries rather than the cultural industries, nobody who I've spoken to who was involved in the time thought that this terminology was produced by that kind of ideological shift, in a sense. So there was a question of language, I think, is quite interesting here. But it did retain, despite this kind of shift and the, and the underlying ideological shift behind it, it did retain some of the old elements of cultural industry strategies. It, ret it retained a concern primarily with local economic development. So the idea of indigenous, city-based, regional-based development in these kind of sectors was retained, partly because and this is a sort of pragmatic reason, partly because most of the work in this area, most of the policy development, most of the funding, most of the ideas, were done at a local and regional level. So it's mostly cities, regional government, uh, local authorities who were doing this kind of thing. It also retained an, a notion of, um, in, the, in a rather unfortunate phrase that one of, um, somebody used about the time, redistributing opportunity. And that's a classic kind of new labour phrase. You can no longer redistribute wealth or power but you can sort of redistribute opportunity. The notion was that you have to allow everybody to succeed in society. That This is the kind of, we can no longer change society, but at least we should get everybody a fair chance of trying to be able to succeed in this society. So there was a notion, both rhetorically, this issue about marginalised communities, and in practice, if you actually trace where the money went into, into creative industry support agencies over the last 10 years, most of it has gone uh, to things which have an explicit remit to target uh, uh, ethnic minorities, women, and uh, poor people. They're no longer called working class people, but, but poor people. It's, it's, that, that, that has remained the case, that that's where a lot of the money in these kind of areas has gone. Uh, but the other thing, the thing that distinguishes it from what I'm going to come on to now is that creative industry strategies, like cultural industry strategies, were fundamentally about the production of cultural products. The idea was still, how do we produce more, better, different kind of cultural products, and how do we get different people to, to experience them? Okay, uh, Toby was talking before I wrote this slide while he was talking when he mentioned the issue of the great and the good and it reminded me of just one example I'll give you of this kind of policy making process. Ken Livingstone recently elected Mayor of London having been uh, instrumental in the first cultural industry strategy in about 2002 set up a commission on the creative industries in London. And if you Google it you can find, it's one of those really interesting things that sort of disappear but you can find odd bits of documents floating around. Uh, it was obviously a total failure, which is why it's disappeared. But anyway, he set up this commission on the creative industries. He'd just come into power, and he wanted to return to this issue. He also said, because um, I was asked to, to work on this commission, and I, I said to the, fr the friend of mine who asked me to work on this, is this going to be the usual great and the good? And he said to me, no, Kate, it's just the good in this instance. Um, <laughs> And it was absolutely true. The, the makeup of people on this commission is sort of worthy of study in itself. There were almost no corporates. There was one woman who was from Yahoo Europe, and she never came to a single meeting. The rest of the people were community arts activists, 
third sector people, education people, and people from kind of institutions like the Royal Society of Arts. It was the good bit of the great and the good, uh, in a sense. Um, so Livingston had come to the first meeting, he never came again either, but he came to the first meeting of this commission and it was a sort of um, um, commission process where you take evidence from experts and they submit papers and you have sort of 12 people who think about these things and then they report at the end, it was that, that sort of classic process. Livingston comes to the first meeting of this and he says he's been reading Peter Hall's book, Cities and Civilization. Um, a magisterial book on cities and civilization, if you ask me, incredibly long, and he was also right, he was running for mayor, so I was very impressed by the idea that he'd actually read Peter Hall's work on this, which I do commend you if you've got sort of six months spare. Um, <laughs> but, but he'd been reading this, and what he'd taken from this incredibly long series of case studies about different cities was that culture was the key to which by which cities could regenerate and remake themselves in all senses, not simply in the economic sense, but in the sense that Juan, you were talking about before, of allowing for different possibilities and different kind of imaginaries in the kind of Althusserian sense. So that the culture was the, was the element, uh, in a sense, that would allow cities to remake and regenerate themselves, and that this is what he absolutely believed, and therefore he wanted to support this, this creative industries kind of task force. Now, there's a long story about the creative industry, about the, the Mers Commission, which I, I could go into, but I won't now. Um, but a fundamentally, it was a very interesting mix of economic development in the cultural industry sense, i.e., how do we support uh, more furniture making in the East End of London? Let's set up an initiative for furniture making, local uh, sustainable furniture making. We've got some skills here. Let's do, do business support. Regeneration and uh, almost sort of David Harvey style kind of city marketing. Uh, and the city marketing element is new. That's definitely something that came in with the kind of creative industry sort of discourse that wouldn't have been part of the, of the original um, cultural industries thing. But, 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 but Livingston was very clear about this. He said, in fact, when discussing the advantage of London, he said, I think one of the things that cements our strength as such a strong financial centre and gives us a margin over places like Frankfurt is that once you have a hard day's work, this city has a diversity of offerings in terms of cultural and leisure centres unrivaled anywhere else classic city marketing. The reason we keep the financial sector happy to be in London is that even bankers don't want to live in Frankfurt, I think was kind of what he was sort of, what, what he was sort of saying. Um, now, one of the, the interesting thing about the, the commission, it was clearly a failure in, in many ways, and having been part of it, I got some idea of some of the ways. But one of the interesting things about it was that although it was branded as the creative industries, the MERS Commission on the Creative Industries, and it had lots of creative industries rhetoric wrapped around it, in practice, most of the money that it distributed over the next sort of few years, most of the millions of pounds that it gave out, went to arts organisations. They went to the support of the traditional arts. So the things that got money, for example, were the Notting Hill Carnival, right? Notting Hill Carnival, London's largest street festival, Europe's largest street festival, I think, celebration of uh, West Indian culture in Europe, uh, the London Film Festival, which is a consumer film festival. You go along and watch movies, not a trade show. Very few people sell movies at, 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 at the London Film Festival, so it's not like uh, Cannes. Um, uh, the production of a new dance centre, uh, the Le Band Centre in, in, in South East London, a design festival, and rather fantastically speaking as we were of Zoccolas, um, a, a, an art competition to uh, design a piece of art which would occupy the, what's called the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square is, uh, as whether you don't know, a major sort of uh, zoccola in, in London, and it has various plinths, all of which have military figures. Statues of great British military figures or Commonwealth military figures on them. Uh, one of these plinths was empty. We now know that it's going to be uh, filled with a statue of the Queen when she dies. But for, well, before we were allowed to know that, um, the fourth plinth was the subject of an art competition, and various artists, including Rachel, Rachel Whiteread and others, have had pieces of art on that. And one of the things that the MERS Commission on Creative Industries funded was this art competition. So the point I'm making here, I suppose, is that although the creative industries discourse is very different in some ways, although it's underlied by an ideological shift, in practice, the things that it gave money to are actually not that different than the things that a cultural industry strategy would have given money to, or in fact, the things that an arts funding strategy would give money to. So I think the interesting question then becomes, if practice really is the same, what, what function does the discourse serve, in a sense, and in what ways is, kind of, is, is, in what ways is practice different if it appears to be the same? It's not quite the same, in what ways is it different? Because it's clearly not a very tight linking between a totally different discourse and totally different forms of practice. And one of the 
interesting answers to this question when I've spoken to people about it uh, who are involved in this kind of thing, is a sort of um, the notion that, in a sense, despite the kind of strength of rhetoric and strength of kind of um, talk about creative industries, most of the uh, organizations with which governments deal, particularly in a kind of European context, I mean, the advertising industry, for example, doesn't get that kind of public funding. Even if you want to support the advertising industry in Britain, you're not going to do it by giving them grants to small advertising agencies. You, you, you know, the market effectively takes care of it. Similarly with architecture, it's not the direct recipient of public funding other than through the commission of buildings. Similarly with things like design. So the money often ends, ends up going to traditional institutions who are set up to receive public monies. And that's as much about the historical relationships and kind of practice as it is about anything um, ideological in a sense. Okay, um, I don't have any slides of him in his underwear or anything else, but I'm just going to spend five minutes on what I've called the Florida impact here. Uh, into this world of cultural industries becomes creative industries. Um, in whenever his book was published, I think 2002 or something, his first book, Rise of Creative Class, uh, comes the work of Richard Florida. Now, in the, in the piece that's posted on the site that I wrote about Florida, um, there's a reference to Jamie Peck's piece on Florida, which is very good. And uh, he coined this term fast policy, the notion that policy is part of the kind of what, you know, Nigel Thrift's kind of knowledge capitalism now. It's increasingly made globally and taken up in particular kind of contexts as part of the sort of circulation of ideas. And the fact, the, the problem about it being fast policy making is that there's no time to kind of reflect on the local circumstances. There isn't enough time to think about how does this actually operate in this context. So Florida's working, beavering away in Carnegie Mellon. What, is, what he's saying actually makes sense in a European context or an Asian context or an African context. In fact, the circuit of kind of knowledge capitalism means that Florida goes around the world and everybody uh, likes the idea and, and thinks it's sexy and, and wants to buy into it. And there isn't enough of a kind of reflective moment about whether this works or not. Um, now, there's a f just, we've had quite a lot of critique of his work, so, and I've also written the paper on the, on the site, so I won't go into this very much. But there are particular problems and particular changes in the way that Florida does creative industries, cultural industries, that mean that there's a definite shift, I think, as a result of the Florida impact, particularly in the minds of policymakers. And if you're wondering why it is the policymakers like Richard Florida so much and why they don't think, as academics tend to, that he's an overpaid buffoon, um, it's because he has numbers behind him. I mean, Florida's work was originally as a relatively serious economic geographer, and his book is full of stats. It's full of stats and regression curves and all sorts of interesting things. It looks empirical. It is empirical to some degree. The, the empirical work can be heavily critiqued, but it has numbers behind it. It, it, it. it looks kind of, in a sense, for policymakers, it's reassuring in some ways that other more problematic kinds of academic work isn't. It gives them something to do. It's a blueprint. Um, the problems with it in, in terms of the way it affected policy, I think, is that fundamentally it's not about the creative industries or the cultural industries. It's nothing to do with culture. Florida's creative class are defined as people in the professional and service sectors who consume cultural products. They don't produce cultural products. I mean, artists are included in his creative class, but so are uh, airline pilots and academics and all sorts of people who we don't think of as cultural producers. So it's fundamentally a consumption based view of the world, and it's an occupational based view of the world, not um, a sectoral based, based view of the world. It's also, and this is crucial, I think, and this is a real change, this probably represents the biggest single shift from a cultural industry's focus. It's about mobility, it's not about place. That, of course, makes it perfect for the kind of Leo, neoliberal discourse. It's Terry Eagleton's great phrase about the postmodern cult of the migrant. It celebrates mobility. It doesn't celebrate place. It's not about what can we do in Sheffield for people in Sheffield or what can we do in Pittsburgh for people in Pittsburgh. It's how can we get, how can we attract the global mobile creative class to these different places. So it's about the people moving around. It's not about the places. And that's really important, I think. It's also about um, creativity. And Florida hardly ever uses the term culture. He talks about the creative class and he talks about creativity. So it's not about culture, it, it's about this thing called creativity. And I'll come into that in a minute. Now, the, the effect of this on policymakers was fundamentally uh, huge confusion, I think, for most cases. Um, a friend of mine who was doing some work in the northeast of England, a place called Middlesbrough, a very depressed, Ross, Ross Bell kind of area, very similar to Pittsburgh, where um, 
Florida was working. It tells the story of going along there to do what was described as a creative industry strategy, walking into this room full of councillors, and the guy having five copies of Richard Florida's Rise of the Creative Class on his desk, and turning to my friend and saying, I want one of these. I want, and, and this is Middlesbrough. This is a town which has very serious problems of unemployment, low educational standards, quite a poor quality environment. Not much crime because it's a very socially cohesive kind of place, but it ain't the kind of place that Richard Florida and his acolytes are ever going to move to, however many makeovers they do of this. There simply isn't the kind of economic uh, well-being in this area to attract the creative class. But suddenly, all sorts of places up and down the country started thinking that instead of actually trying to develop the cultural sectors, which they've been trying to do hitherto, and which is difficult for reasons I'll come into, all they had to do was sort of tart up their kind of in, their, their in, um, amenities and environment, and then they would attract these people who would magically bring with them uh, the means of economic well-being. Okay, the second thing I think which absolutely changes the, the, the creative industries, cultural industries discourse after Florida is um, the sort of uh, QUT model, which we've also talked about, which I know John's going to talk about a lot more on Thursday. But I'll just go into that just a little bit, because I think it's also incredibly relevant and incredibly influential. Um, now, in the QUT model that Stuart Cunningham and, and John Hartley, as Toby's been talking about, or have um, developed over the last few years, similarly to Florida, the creative industries, the cultural industries, become something called creativity. Uh, and the important thing about creativity in this context is it becomes an input. It's an input, not an output. Cultural industry strategies, creative industry strategies are about the development of more cultural stuff and different kinds of cultural stuff. This is about something called creativity as an input into economic growth in general. So it sort of buries the cultural and the artistic in how do we develop economic growth in all kinds of areas. It was a point I was making, I think, last week about um, people in the east of England who want cultural industry strategies in order to boost innovation in the maritime and logistics sectors. There has somehow become this idea that there is this thing called creativity. It's the skills, it's the talent, it's the experience that creatively trained labor has, and it can be used anywhere in the economy. And fundamentally, that's now what it's about. It's become about this input into the rest of the economy. There's a focus in the, in the QUT model on creative labor, not in the Andrew Ross sense of the term creative labor, but in where do people with creative industry degrees go? Where do people who are trained in the arts go? Where do they go and work? And therefore, how can we see how creativity, in this sense, is dispersing throughout the economy? So there's a lot of attempts that they do um, to map where creative labor goes in order to say the creativity and culture is an input into the production of all sorts of other things. Now, more recently, there's been a, f a sort of uh, embracing of, of evolutionary economics, and I may be the worst person in the world to explain to you uh, evolutionary economics. All I know is that every time I try to read something about it, there's lots of formulae in there, and I have to stop immediately. But I, I, I do understand the kind of basic concept, and this is a, this is a development of the kind of QUT model. But in the, in the, in the, in the argument about um, the role of evolutionary economics in this, and here I'm quoting from a paper by Jason Potts and Stuart Cunningham, uh, which is called Four Models of the Creative Industries, and it's on uh, www.cultural-science.org papers. Uh, I sort of feel like Stuart is playing kind of Marshall McLuhan and Annie Hall in this. And, uh, he's got to wander in in a minute and say, you don't understand anything about what I'm doing. Um, when I was leaving uh, Stuart's house, uh, take notice in June, after we had you know, one of you know, 20 years of fights about this, he turned to his children and said, Children, say goodbye to Toby. You may never see him again. Okay, so in this paper, um, Stuart, the, the, the Stuart and, and Jason wrote, they say, and the great thing about Stuart's work, I always think, is it's so incredibly clear that you always know exactly when you're disagreeing with it and when you're agreeing with it. So he says, in this view, the creative industries are mess misspecified as an industry per se, Cultural industries, creative industries, no longer industry, and better models as a complex, evolving system that derives its economic value from the facilitation of economic evolution and the processes of innovation. So this, in some ways, is the sort of triumph of, of the economic culture is valuable because it leads to economic evolution and the process of innovation. It has few other kind of values. Unlike the value of museums or classical arts, which seek cultural value through the maintenance of past knowledge, Creative industries value lies in the development and adoption of new knowledge. Total focus on the novel and the innovative. So at this point, culture has become creativity, 
which has now become innovation. And I'll just spend the last kind of five minutes talking about why I think that's particularly kind of uh, problematic from a cultural point of view, from an artistic point of view. Okay, now, as I've probably been hinting, there are problems with all these kind of approaches. All of these things are difficult to do, right, from a policymaker point of view. Cultural industry strategies are hard to do because of the scale issues I was talking about uh, 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 last week. At uh, what scale does a film industry become kind of viable? How do you get enough capital in a particular area to make um, the production of certain kinds of cultural products vi viable? What do you do about the continuing dominance of kind of global media? What do you do about distribution issues? You know, the films that we've been watching over the last few weeks is, you know, the, the Made in China and all those other films, great. But who gets to see them and how and when? I mean, you know, those problems haven't gone away. We can all make things incredibly uh, easily now, but actually getting them to be seen by people and, and, and people, uh, you know, other than people like ourselves, it remains incredibly difficult. So it's hard to do cultural industry strategies. Creative industries widens those, the kind of things that you're trying to, to have an effect on slightly beyond the cultural, but it breaks the link with, with culture, I think. The term creative industries breaks the link with culture, which I think is problematic, and leads to less kind of clarity in, in, in policy and analytical terms. And then you do get into the question of what, what is it we're talking about here. Might be going on that one. Okay. Just have a pause for readjustment here. Um, sorry, is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, as Toby said this morning, I completely agree with him. Both of these kind of strategies have minimized the issues of cultural labor. I think cultural labor hasn't uh, figured as highly in these kind of strategies as it should have done. Although there is an interesting document at the moment uh, produced by the UK Department of Cultural Media and Sport called Creative Britain. Again, it's full of some horrible rhetoric about creativity, but it does have explicit policies in it, the first time I've ever seen this, for um, apprenticeship. It recognises the problem of unpaid labour as an entry to the cultural industry. So it has explicit policy recommendations for how you get more people from disadvantaged backgrounds to work in these sectors. It doesn't, as I, as I was talking about last week, suggest that working in these sectors may not be something you want people to do. It's about who gets to be included. It's not about the exploitation of cultural labour. But nonetheless, it is a sign that it recognises some of the problematics of, of, of cultural labour. And you know, I totally agree with Toby. It, all, both of these strategies have completely ignored environmental issues. In fact, generally speaking, cultural industry, creative industry strategies suggest that they are environmentally beneficial. Not just that they ha don't have environmental problems, but actually that they contribute to environmental solutions that are environmentally beneficial. But both of these, uh, these kind of approaches are about stimulating cultural production. So they're very difficult to do, but it's quite easy to understand what it is they're trying to do, in a sense. Move on to the kind of creativity innovation um, uh, world of, of Florida, and to some degree, of, and, and to a greater degree probably, of QUT. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes looking at this from the point of view of arts policy and, and the effect on the arts, in a sense. And why is it problematic to have innovation as the um, primary goal for your cultural policies. I think that it's problematic for sort of maybe three or four reasons. The first is that I think it leads to an overfocus on novelty as the only source of kind of cultural value. And even within popular cultural forms, this clearly isn't the case. The reason that people go to see the Rolling Stones perform or packed out the O2 Centre to see Led Zeppelin at the end of last year isn't because they expect Led Zeppelin to take a new musical direction. <laughs> it's not about innovation, it's about collective memory of the past in, in these cases. Therefore, even in popular culture, people are not always seeking the novel and the new. They're often seeking um, different things. Um, it leaves no room, in a sense, for kind of non-innovative art. So if, we, if we're talking, talking earlier about Cary Grant, it's impossible to imagine um, the screwball comedy without the notion of the screwball comedy as a genre. It takes its meaning from other screwball comedies. If you just saw one and you derived from Mars, you wouldn't be able to make any sense of it. Once you've seen 10 of them, you know exactly what's going on. Genre pieces are not all about innovation. They're about reflection of one another. Um, it doesn't leave much, much uh, uh, room for notions of traditional craftsmanship and particularly for kind of notions of, of non-Western art, uh, many of which don't celebrate innovation in the same kind of uh, way that Western art does. So it's a very, very narrow take on the kind of cultural production you want. And interestingly, and I think this is the really neoliberal... Um, kind of moment of this, of this kind of policy. It's a sort of perpetual present. You're trapped in a kind of perpetual present. This is culture without memory. Uh, and it seems in that sense to be um, ideally tuned to kind of neoliberal notions of the future and the mobile uh, and the unmemorized. 
It also reduces, I think, uh, a series of complicated arguments that have been developed in various countries for the importance of kind of cultural production to a single argument. It says cultural production is important because it leads to innovation. I was at a um, talk uh, recently by a, a, a UK guy called Will Hutton, which some of you may or may not know. He's a British journalist, uh, written on China quite recently, and is now, for some reason, writing about the cultural industries about which he knows nothing. Um, and he was talking about the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It's a huge museum of decorative arts, one of the world's great decorative arts collections. And he was saying, if only we understood the role that the Victoria and Albert Museum plays in innovation in the design industries and innovation in fashion and things like that, then we, could, we would all, you know. Um, to which the answer is, if it doesn't play that role, what are you going to do? Shut it down? You know, close down this world class collection? Stop it being a home for cultural tourists. Stop it being a place for London citizens to go. All the different arguments that we have for the support of culture are collapsed to this single argument about the role of uh, innovation. The third thing I think that's problematic is that it leads to increasing attempts, and this does bring us back to the academy a little bit, to insert innovation, notions of innovation, into arts and cultural education. And Dick was talking about this a little bit the other day, and I've been talking about it with some people here. Um, but I, my concern about that is it might result in weakening the very conditions that have led us to have a successful arts education tradition in many places. I, um, Goldsmiths, I know there's a couple of Goldsmiths people here, um, the, the university that nurtured Damien Hirst, probably the, whatever you think about his work, one of the most innovative artists in the last sort of 20 years, one of the most entrepreneurial artists in the last 20 years, um, is now setting up an institute of uh, cultural entrepreneurship. Um, and I said to the guy, the vice chancellor of, of Goldsmiths, who's a very nice guy, very smart, and I said to him, how come you managed to produce Damien Hirst without teaching him entrepreneurship? And now you want people to teach people entrepreneurship? Why don't you just carry on teaching them fine art and see if they turn into entrepreneurs? But no, we have to now have this notion of entrepreneurship and innovation being inserted into kind of arts education, as if traditional arts education hadn't produced entrepreneurs. And the final point, and this comes to the question that, that we ended up with at, at the end here, and I totally agree. Uh, the, the final concern that I have about this is that it leaves traditional cultural and arts policy totally uncritiqued. Whereas original cultural industry, creative industry strategies, to some degree, were a response to the problems of traditional arts strategies, of the privileging of certain kinds of high arts. Now what's happened is that the cultural industries, creative industry people have gone into the box called innovation and economic growth, which leaves arts advocates much more comfortably on their own, back in their bunker, defending quality and excellence in the arts. Because the people who are involved in the, in the innovation side have lost total interest in critiquing the arts, have lost interest in the issue, no longer have anything to, to, to say about it but because they're interested in, in sources of economic growth. And, and documents coming out of arts agencies show a return to a very uncritiqued notion of the importance of the arts and what kind of arts we should support and how. And all the real questions about you know, what counts as culture, whose culture, who gets to produce it, who gets to consume it, still the real questions um, that uh, sort of dog policy in this area just don't get addressed at all um, when industrial production of culture gets hived off into kind of innovation. So what to do about this? <laughs> um, just finally, because I'm a mostly consultant rather than academic, I can never just leave it at the problematic. I have to do a sort of one slide that says, what should we do about this? Um, I think that I mean, this conference has been really, really interesting and really, really useful to me. Um, and I think there's a real need to re-engage academic and policy and, and sort of uh, work in this area. And it, it, it does go on at the margins, but it, it's still frowned upon, as Toby was saying and as um, George was saying. It's still frowned upon in many academic circles to have anything to do with the policy-making process, to have anything to do with these kind of conversations other than uh, in, in critique mode. And I think that's, fund that's un ultimately a bit of a dead end. I mean, my, my least favorite kind of critique of these sort of things, and I think, cause, probably because I think it's lazy, is that you'll see a lot of critiques of, of the discourse of creative industries, which do very little other than reproduce what's in the document with put square quotes around it. That's a classic kind of fairly lazy kind of critique that, w that what we must do is show that this is clearly a silly thing to say by putting quotes around it. But actually, there's very little attempt to investigate how those discourses get made and how in practice they get enacted. So I think we need much more empirical work about how those discourses are understood by the people who are using them all the time and how they get enacted in the world because there's a big gap between the two things. It's not enough just to read the document and say this is clearly silly. Um, there's a need, I think, just for much more empirical work in this area. And it's interesting that Toby mentioned uh, Liverpool City of Culture, which in many ways um, has been, I think, clearly will not deliver 
on any of the kind of grandiose claims that were made for it in terms of economic regeneration of the city and cultural development. But the reason that we'll know that it won't deliver on those kind of things is because it's actually a piece of work, a very long-term empirical piece of work called Impacts 08, being run out of Liverpool University, which is tracking many, many of the indicators over the period of the city of culture and beyond, um, which will tell us, which will give us a sort of empirical evidence base about these kind of things. So there is better more high quality research, empirical research going on with these things. And of course, much of it is compromised. The kind of questions that you get to ask are not always the kind of questions that you want to ask. But nonetheless, there will be. Uh, we won't just have to you know, discuss between ourselves whether we think it worked or not. There will actually be some evidence about who got jobs, who got education, who got exposed to different cultural forms and, and how. Um, I think we need a focus, a much greater focus, particularly in policy terms, but also obviously in academic terms, on labour. That sort of goes without saying, it's been a kind of theme of the week. And obviously, um, by ha having given you this very kind of UK and British perspective, hope to make some kind of connections with your own circumstances, your own countries, I obviously think that we need greater uh, international comparative work in this area. And this has been a really useful start, at least personally for me, in that regard. Thanks very much. Oh, it's nearly lunchtime as well. Mm. Do you think you're going to get out of this? <laughs> 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 That's all, okay, five minutes, go on. <laughs> Thank you, that was um, great bringing us back to the history of the London Council and, uh, um, and uh, the shift from, from culture industries to creative industries. Um, just uh, to kind of compare with you maybe, uh, other um, genealogies of the creative part, mm -hmm. the creativity linked to entrepreneurialism, um, because it just kind of occurred to me, and when you're talking about walking in an office and seeing the stack of books on the desk, you know, when I, back in the early 90s, worked in, you know, as a kind of more in policy fields for the UN and for like the cultural attaché at the Egyptian embassy, at American embassy in Egypt and things like that, working in urban development, uh, the book that was always sitting on the desk was Hernando de Soto's The Other Path. And um, the late na 80s and the early 90s, the creativity and entrepreneurialism was coming from the, the very bottom, right? Mm -hmm. The global mobile class. It was the, the creativity of the urban poor, the, the people that had lost mm -hmm. the most in the early violent stages of militarized neoliberalism. But, create, but the U.S. Embassy, the U.N., was pushing and Ana de Soto's book, which I'm sure you've heard, you know, Informal Economy, and, yeah. and so creativity had, and I don't remember at that point coming across creative industries discourse other than the Horkheimer Adorno critique. Mm -hmm. In that period outside um, of the US and Europe, and I'm just, and, and I think then in the late 90s, the Informal Economy bottom-up approach to creativity became criminalized as, as kind of subaltern creativity became identified with trafficking and terrorism and was, and everybody seemed to pull out of that Hernando de Soto model. So I'm wondering if we, instead of, since we've been following culture mm -hmm. as the anchor, if we fo focus on entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. and, and this shift mm -hmm. from the bottom-up strategies, looking at subaltern and, and, and marginalized actors, and then this shift suddenly from a very top-down approach, what other genealogies yeah. do we get and yeah. how that compares that's just kind of a complimentary reading. no I, I completely agree with you and entrepreneurialism is definitely one of the things that kind of feeds in into this um, I wasn't I didn't want to suggest that there's a single origin for these kind of things but obviously different things feed in entrepreneurialism absolutely and it's also clear that in the in the UK context um, exactly that thing as Angela and I think Dick were talking about the notion of the cultural entrepreneur as the kind of refusenik of work and those kind of ideas about sort of liberation from work that were buried in that. But then in the period of the, of the sort of 90s, um, as you say, entrepreneurialism was setting up raves. Entrepreneurialism was, dr became drug trafficking. Entrepreneurialism became the anti-globalization movement. And suddenly there was like too much entrepreneurialism going on and not the right kind of entrepreneurialism and not the right people being entrepreneurial. So although you still hear the term, that notion of of, of the entrepreneurial has been, um, in some ways, quite interestingly sanitized by the notion of social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship for the public good, as opposed to anti-social entrepreneurship, mm 
uh, which is the kind of informal economy. So I think that's, it's quite interesting that some of that hangs around, and that's one of the interesting things about these things, and you know, what hangs around in what way. But I, but I absolutely think you're right. I think the concern with kind of criminality and uh, entrepreneurship, and also the idea that if you were kind of, it's like creativity, you've got to be creative enough to work, but never creative enough to question the conditions of work kind of thing. You've got to be entrepreneurial enough to do these things, but not so entrepreneurial that your entrepreneurship is disturbing in some ways. So and I think that's exactly what happened around uh, that time. Yeah. So my question also applies to Toby's talk. Um, but I had a question about um, making non-empirical research appealing to policymakers. Like one of the things that you mentioned was about um, Florida's popularity coming from the fact that he uses data and statistics and charts and this sort of thing. Um, and um, its currency among policymakers. And I was wondering about research that deals, um, that's more um, prevalent in the humanities, like, you know, such as research that has high theory or what we think of as high theory in it. How do you make that, how would you suggest we make that uh, legible to policymakers? Um, high theory stuff is difficult and you have to bury it. You, have, you effectively have to bury it. You have to be informed by it, but not seek to intimidate people by it. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, sort of, it's a sort of serious point. You know, in academia, you gain kudos for knowing these things. And, and in the policy world, you gain kudos for knowing them and not talking about them. So there's a kind of buried sort of, sort of discourse of these things. But I think there is, I mean, what I hear a lot from, from mm -hmm. policymakers, particularly in certain kinds of work, is we need some narrative on this. This is a really common phrase. People are always telling you that, they're hard, that we need a new narrative. We want a narrative on this. The term narrative I hear used much more in that context than anything else. So there's clearly a sort of storytelling role. And often what you're asked to do is to come up with a narrative or a story for a particular place for its possibilities for what you might do. Um, so I think that's one way, that kind of ability to develop and help people to develop a story about themselves is actually really quite useful and it doesn't have to be I mean if you're you know it depends on how you do it and who you're doing it with and what you're doing it for obviously but it doesn't have to be a kind of um, uh, reactionary kind of thing to do there's a genuine I think um, need uh, for um, articulating what you're doing in a way that, that that's you know accessible to people the kind of story making thing that, that that artists do really in a sense and that's why interestingly one of the big um, areas for artists to work these days is in is in urban regeneration and urban development policies because artists do storytelling and how we tell stories about each other is important to urban regeneration so I think that's probably the, the, the best uh, way forward um, as I say theoretical work keep it quiet really yeah. unless it's some unless it's a buzzword person I mean I wouldn't describe Florida's work or anything like that unless it's a buzzword sort of person certain people become kind of hip at certain times, but it's very, really, really theoretical kind of things. I mean, um, you know, I don't know, Mark Moore's work on public value, for example, which he did at Harvard about, largely about the public value that librarians and other people um, provided in their work as, as a way of trying to capture the notion of um, the value of public services, which I've written very critically about because I, I dislike the discourse of public value. But it's one of those things whereby you realize after a while, that instead of critiquing the discourse, you have to understand what people are kind of using it for. And that, that would be a good example where you could, for a while, say, you, can, you could always say, I'm influenced by the work of Robert Putnam. You could say, I'm influenced by the work of Mark Moore on public value. There are certain academic names you can drop uh, which aren't, which have become current and aren't too intimidating to people, but it's generally not in a kind of overly theorized sort of way. Yeah, actually, to that effect, I'm kind of curious to know what your response to it would be to like uh, the role of Braidotti and Vatimo in the European Parliament, who are you know philosophers and do quote unquote high theory, and who actually act on very pragmatic means at the level of the European Parliament, which kind of goes against what you were just saying. So I wonder if you had thoughts on. Well, I don't know how, how they do it in practice. I'd, I'd be interested to look at the way that they talk about it and, and the sort of discourse. I mean, it's Toby's point about uh, uh, Hoggett earlier on. It's not that theoreticians haven't done these kind of things in the past, but the way that they do it and the language that they use and, the, and, the, and, and that kind of thing, I think, is, is, uh, um, is, is crucial in a sense. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not for a moment suggesting that people who are high, I mean, people who run many of whom are, for my sins, friends of mine, you know, the New Labour Number 10 Policy Unit have read every possible work on, on political theory that you can imagine. But they don't talk in that language. It's about the language that you use, I think. So it's, it really is a question of, of discourse. Uh, 
If, if you, I don't know if you've read it or not, but you can probably Google it and I can send it to you. If you want to think, want to work out what's going to happen with um, cultural policy in London, uh, there's a speech that Boris Johnson gave about two months ago about this, this vexed issue of what's going to go on the fourth plinth. Um, and his argument was, was instead of having all this arty-farty postmodern nonsense, we'd have a statue of a war hero. Only this wouldn't be a British war hero, it would be a New Zealand war hero, Keith Park. Um, and he, it's an extraordinary... Um, uh, speech that he gave because it's so full of utterly uh, uncritiqued notions of high culture. I mean, at one point he says, I know, he says, he says I'm, and I shouldn't misquote him here because it's really important, but he says something along the lines of, uh, it's basically a defense of the kind of dominance of, of high art in the European context. Uh, and he sort of says, I know people say that the, I don't know, um, the recent um, um, terracotta army exhibition was, you know, fantastic and how marvelous and what this tells us about China. But frankly, it's not as good as a Raphael. Kind of, I mean, it's almost literally like that. It's written for a kind of spectator kind of audience, and this was a speech that he gave. So I think absolutely we'll see a return to. I mean, if I were worried about being a consultant in the new regime, I'd be but dusting off my art for art's sake arguments. We'll see a return to uncritiqued notions of kind of um, the arts and the importance of the arts, some of which have some merit. So I'm not saying they don't. Um, and we'll see um, the creative industry stuff go off into economic, you know, into innovation. And, 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 and to utterly uncritic notions of innovation. Um, so I think it's not great, really. <laughs> okay. Great. I think you've earned your lunch.